Good morning. Let's go ahead and gather our seats. Come together. Not you. Good morning. I'm John Weaver. I have the benefit of introducing myself. I want to tell you about my peer-reviewed article on why Arkansas is the best state in the country. <laughs> One Pulitzer, a um, few other awards. Not true, but I'm introducing myself so I can make the stories up, right? This morning I'm talking about the giving of the law, the giving of the law. If you have your Bibles, you turn over to Exodus chapter 20, and we'll focus there this morning, the giving of the law. I want to suggest to you this morning uh, seven rules. You might think of them as guidelines or principles for reading the law. Have you all seen the movie, the Mel Brooks movie, The History of the World Part One? A little bit irreverent. There's this great scene uh, in that movie where Mel Brooks receives uh, the Ten Commandments from God on Sinai, and actually it ends up being 15 commandments. And he goes up, and God gives him 15 commandments, and he comes down off the mount, and he stands before the people of Israel. And he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God. And he, God has given you 15. And right at that moment, one of the three tablets falls to the ground. He says, Oi, 10 commandments, 10 commandments God has given you from 15 to 10. Well, my, lo my rules for reading the, the, the law and for understanding the law at one time was seven, but I couldn't print out the final three. So, I'm kidding. No, but, so today we're going to go with seven, seven rules for reading the law. Oy. So first, the first law or rule for reading the law. The law is complex. The law is complex. Following God's law is sometimes complicated. And, and keeping the law oftentimes involves a process of, of discernment, of determining the right way. It's not immediately apparent. One needs to infer some things in order to obey God's law. If one was a Jew like Saul in the first century, and you would know that the law came from God. You would know that God delivered the law to Moses on Sinai. And if you were a Jew like Paul, you would know in the first century that the law was something God had given his people. It was a, a form of divine grace. You wouldn't think of it as something that Israel earned to have the law. And you would think of the law as something which allowed Israel to be in proximity to God. The law was something that was not only making Israel holy, it was an act of piety, the sort of thing which you read about in the Torah Psalms. The, in the Torah Psalms, you read about God's law, Torah. What is Torah, this Hebrew word? Well, it's commandment. But it's more than that. It's the Ten Commandments. But it's more than that. It's the book of Moses. But it's more than that. It's the books of Moses. It's more than that. It's the law in the Old Testament. More than that, it's the life of the Jew. Torah is one of these words which can mean multiple things, and for Saul, who became Paul, he would have known that that was a gift of God to Israel. He says as much over in Romans chapter 9, verse 4. They're Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenant, the giving of the law. And he would know, as many first Christ century Christians did, that Moses was the one that gave the law. You remember there in John chapter 1, a passage we'll come back to. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ, John 1, 17. So it came to Israel. It was given by Moses, but when was it given? Now that's a more complicated question. When was it given? It was given at Sinai, we know. You can turn over in your Bibles as I asked you to Exodus chapter 20. And in a prototypical sense, Exodus 20 is the Decalogue. These 10 words is where the law was given, Decalogue, 10 words. And so if I was the young Saul, maybe growing up in Tarshish, I would be looking to the law to know how to live. And if I was growing up in a pagan culture, I'd see idols all around me, and the question would be, what's my relationship to these idols? What should I do with them? And so I would turn over to the law, Exodus 20, and open it up, and I'd see there in Exodus 20 the statement, you shall have no other gods before me. Verses 3 and 4, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Exodus 23 through 4. Got it. No wooden or carved ivory image. Got it. 
no carved image, so I'm good. I want to do iron, though. I can cast iron, right? And so I'm sitting there in Tarshish. I'm, I'm at the seat of Gamaliel, feet of Gamaliel learning. And one of my uh, Pharisee roommates says, uh, Saul, uh, you know about the other giving the law, right? Oh, there's more? And so he reminds me there's more than one giving of the law. In fact, there's given twice at Sinai. And so my roommate reminds me, as does Gamaliel, that the law is not simple. It's more complex. And the interpretation of the law is complex because the giving of the law and the recording of the law is complex. It's multifaceted. It requires wisdom and discernment. There's a compilation and a combination that goes into knowing what the law says. So, if you turn over to Exodus chapter 32, verse 19, you read there that the law, the tablets were broken. We know that scene well. Moses throws them down. And the initial stones are broken, and after the initial confirmation of the book of the covenant in Exodus 34, there's a remaking of the tablets. And you can turn over to Exodus 34, verse 4, and you can see that not only the covenant, the tablets remade in a new way, but there's also a renewal of the covenant. And so you have a repeating of the pattern of the revelation from Sinai. Think about that for a moment. Two revelations from Sinai, two sets of, of tablets, two confirmations. And then in that second one, in that second elaboration of the commandment, you have a commandment in this context against graven images that includes a prohibition against gods made of cast metal. That's in 3417. Presumably, this is driven by circumstance. Why? Well, of course, what's happened? This is a clarifi clarification needed because what did Aaron and the people do? The, precisely that. And so you have a development of the law here uh, prohibiting graven images now. This is not in the original 10. So the stipulations of the law, uh, the statutes and the commands, are set here in these chapters within a story. I just told you a story in which you read about two giving of the laws. And that's important to recognize because you have this narrative here about God's prophet Moses and God's people. And within the context of that story, you have the giving of the law. In fact, two givings of the law. And so it's important to recognize that when we think about the law of Moses, we not think about some list, some serial list of, of regulations one we just go to and check off. There is a story about what God is up to in the world and how we should understand what God is up to and how we should act in light of how God acts. And this brings me to my second, uh, we'll call it a rule, principle. So not only is the law complex, the law is story, or at least storied. So both the law of Moses, and we will look at this morning the law of Christ, are rules for godly living that are revealed in and through a, a theological story, a story about what God is up to in the world, God's prophet, God's people. And so the story of the giving of the law at Sinai is more than just these two accounts of the giving of the Decalogue, the, the, the four tablets, as it were. Uh, you have, in addition to the Ten Commandments there in Exodus 20, you have the book of the covenant. You read those laws about relationship to not only other people, but to God. If you turn over to Exodus chapter uh, 24, verse 7, that's a major part of the law that is, some would say, an elaboration. I don't think so. It's just an addition to the, the Ten Commandments. And that includes these multiple laws. And it goes on in chapter 25 through 40 to describe the pattern of the tabernacle and how Israel should build the tabernacle. You're very familiar with that, but just catch that for a moment. Did you just hear what I said? 25 through 40 of Exodus, that's what we're talking about here. Is there, is there a class on the building of the tabernacle, Tom? We don't think about that. But that's almost half the book, and in, in many ways, the tabernacle represents a, a climax of the, of the book. You could argue contrary to the speaker last night and what I might say later today, is that the climactic moment in Exodus is not the, t the crossing of the Red Sea, and it's not the giving of the, ten, the laws at Sinai, it's the filling of the tabernacle with the glory of God in Exodus 40. And so you come down to Exodus 40, verse 34, when the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Punchline. 
So what God in Exodus is doing and what the New Testament writers emphasize about this book is that he's giving a pattern for the tabernacle so that by obeying the law, which the tabernacle pattern is a part of, Israel might have God's presence among them. And that's the point of much of this book. And so you see that in Exodus 25, verse 40, and see that you make them after the pattern for them, which is being shown to you on the mountain. And as you know, Stephen emphasizes that in Acts 7, and Paul, the Hebrew writer will emphasize that over in Hebrews 8, verse 5, that, that God through Moses gave this pattern so that God could be present among his people. So this, this leads to a, a third rule. So not only is it complex and not only is it storied, but the law... Covenant requires law. So we're talking this week about covenant, and I'm talking about the giving of the law, and my point would be is that you can't have covenant without law. It's necessity. So biblical covenants are conditional relationships with God in the Bible. And what you see is that in both the Old and the New Testament, you have a requirement that there is a sort of law for God's people in both the Old and the New. There's a need for a pattern of work and worship among God's people. What we're saying here is that to have an old and new covenant, you need a standard. You need a sort of blueprint. You need a model for living, rules for life. What we're going to see is this first happens in Sinai and then with Jesus in the early church. But think about our young Saul. You see him again for a moment there in the first century. So he's reading along the book of the covenant. He's passed the Ten Commandments. He's reading in the book of the covenant, and he's realizing that there is more to know. He continues to read. For him to study and to keep, he has to keep on reading. And so, for example, he would learn in Exodus 20, where we have turned, that the, about the initial Sabbath law. You turn over to Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11. You read about those well familiar to you. Cast your eyes over those. But then he would turn, as he reads, over to Exodus 31. And in Exodus 31, verses 12 through 17, he'd realize that what he read before, 11 chapters or so in our modern accounting, it was different. In Exodus 31, 12 through 17, he'd realize that there are some additional rules, that if you don't keep the Sabbath, you die. That's a helpful thing to know. <laughs> if you profane the Sabbath... Exodus 31, verse 14, there's a penalty of death. And then he keeps on reading. In Exodus 35, again, a general Sabbath law that includes specification that you cannot make a fire. Again, you had to keep reading to find that. So he, he takes the scroll, he's done. And then he realizes on Gamaliel's shelf, there's another scroll up there. Ah, what is this? Numbers, as we would call it. And he pulls numbers off, and he realizes it's not the end of the story. And so he begins to read in numbers, and he quickly realizes that this is more about the giving of the law. And so in Numbers chapter 1, he'd realize that, that the law is given at Mount Sinai, and it is repeated, that fact is repeated over and over again throughout the book of Numbers. But in unique ways, so that sometimes Moses is speaking from the tabernacle, giving the law, and sometimes he's speaking from Sinai, giving the law. And you begin to understand that Sinai is not only a historical event, it's a pattern that begins to recur throughout the book of Numbers, indicating that what is being revealed is from God. It is an authoritative pattern showing that what this book is, is God's will. It's God's rules. And so you see in, in this unfold throughout Numbers, and then he goes to Leviticus, and he realizes the same thing, and then, of course, Deuteronomy. We know about Deuteronomy. And so all of these uh, are telling Saul more about what God's law is. And so, for example, if you turn over to Numbers 15, 37... We're all the way out in the wilderness, and we, we read in, in Numbers 15, 37, that um, the Israelites need to have tassels on their garments. Details, details. And you have to read books and chapters to get to it. And that that is revealed according, it says, to the pattern of the Lord speaking to Moses and the people 
when they came out of the land of Egypt. So that's in exit Numbers 15, 41. So you can see that the giving of the law is not just one event. It, it's something that recurs in different ways throughout the books. And so it's not a one-time Sinai event. And what you see is the giving of the law reveals not only what they should do, but why they should do it. And in order to understand those things, you need to keep reading. So let's think about Saul for a moment. If I'm Saul and I'm a busy man, as I'm sure he was, he has questions about Sabbath. Why Sabbath? Because is that really, is that non-negotiable? And so he begins to ask, okay, I know I need to keep Sabbath, but why and, and wherefore? So you go back over to Exodus chapter 20, and you read in Exodus chapter 20 that the Sabbath has to do uh, there with creation. You recall there in Exodus chapter 20, verse 11, that Sabbath recalls the creation and the rest of God on the seventh day. Okay. So he keeps reading, and in Deuteronomy, he comes to the realization as he turns over to the giving of the re-giving of the law there, or the repetition of the law there in Deuteronomy 5, verse 15, that there's more to this story, that in fact, there, because the other is assumed in Exodus 20, Moses tells more, and he says, you should keep the Sabbath day, and particularly allow your slaves to keep the Sabbath day. Why? Because of the Exodus, and you were slaves. He says they should command, they should observe the Sabbath day as a memorial rest given in memory of the Exodus from Egypt. Now, these are not contradictory, but they're different different reasons for the story. And the point here is, is that the giving of the law is both what and a why. It is, it is rules to live by, but it's theological in the sense that it helps us understand why God does what He does. It's a telling of God's plan and God's hand. It's a model for revealing what God wants us to do. You tracking with me? Okay. So, third, we've seen covenant requires law. That's, it, there's not a covenant that doesn't have law. That's going to be true of old and new. Okay, fourth. Fourth. The biblical pattern is theological. The biblical pattern is theological. Now, there are reasons I'm saying this. There are recent books out here that I'm trying to address without naming them. But if you know what I'm talking about, you may know where I'm coming from. But this point stands on its own. A theological hermeneutic and a blueprint hermeneutic are not antithetical. So, they are complementary. You see that throughout Scripture. Sinai is a historical place. I believe that with all my heart, and that actually happened. It seems as though God lives there, doesn't it? At least for a time. At least He manifests Himself there. And it's a literary symbol. It's a literary story, the Sinai. We, we know that story, and Hollywood tells that story. But Sinai not only is a story and a historical place, it is also a standard it is a constitution. It is a pattern for life. And so, moving forward in the text, what we find is that what's true of Sinai is true of the story of the Exodus. It's true in the wilderness. That these are theological stories that also tell, show, and imply what the Israelites are to do. It's, it's together. Two parts of the same thing, flip sides of the coin. And in the New Testament, we'll see it's the same way. In the New Testament, the four Gospels are stories. I believe the Gospels can best be described as biographies of Jesus. But the ancient biography, as you see that today, they are meant as models for conduct. They are exemplars. It's not just flat story. It's meant to cause you to want to be like the person that it's telling the story about. It's both a pattern and a story. Acts, I think, is appropriately described as apologetic history. It's an ancient genre of writing. And what that means is it's giving a story defense of the early Christians that they are true and right. They are God's people. But at the same time, it's putting out a, a, a prescriptive pattern for how other people should be. And so those two things go together. A very specific way of being God's people, gathering in a certain way, living in a certain way, worshiping in a certain way. Those things go together, story and pattern. The New Testament epistles are full of standards of conduct. And these are expressed through ancient uh, standards of, of rhetoric, uh, protreptic and paranetic rhetoric. And the point of the rhetoric that Paul and others use is to encourage and to model conduct for early Christians. I'm going to tell you what you should be like, not only you, but all who come after you.
and, and there are others. And the point here is, is that the New Testament writings are both pattern and theology. They describe individual and collective actions and attitudes to be encouraged and emulated. Let's go back to the Old Testament for a moment. We'll come back to the New. Think about Leviticus. My father loved Leviticus. And he would spend years in Leviticus studying it. And, and what he saw there, I think, is that you see in Leviticus principles of how God reveals God's self in the Old Testament, which are powerful. The book conveys laws given by Moses from revelations of God in the tabernacle, in the wilderness as they've traveled out already from Sinai. But, but as they travel and Moses comes out from the temple, from the tabernacle, and he tells them what God wants, the text always comes back. And it repeats laws which were given at Sinai. You can almost intersperse them there in Leviticus. And so the point here is Leviticus begins with a revelation from the tent of meeting on the different sacrifices there in, in Leviticus 1 down through 7. And at the end of chapter 7, 738, you read this. This is the law of the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the ordination offering, the peace offering, which the Lord commanded Moses on Sinai. On the day that he commanded the people of Israel to bring their offering to the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. The interesting thing is that this has not been presented up until this point as being from Sinai. But Sinai here, you see, is this sort of seminal event. It's this source from which God's revelation comes. And it's a pattern. You know that if Sinai is mentioned, it's from God, it's from Moses. That's the source. And so you have more revelations from the tabernacle. And, Le and Leviticus concludes with a reference back to the events at Sinai. Leviticus 27, verse 34. These are the commandments the Lord commanded Moses for the people of Israel on Mount Sinai. So it just envelops the whole book and says, wherever else this came from, one place it gets back to is Sinai. So as I say, Sinai is a seminal historical event. It actually happened and a timeless standard and model. That's repeated and elaborated in Exodus and Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And so when we talk about the law of Moses, it wasn't a law given in one place. It wasn't even given in one book. You have a collection here of instructions for the life uh, that, that Moses gave, and it's done in different ways, in different contexts. And, and what Saul and other Jews had to do is they had to go and read the books and compile them and compare them. And they had to communicate them <laughs> to their children and teach others and repeat them through time. It was complex. It was a story. And the covenant required it. And it was deeply theological because it was about what they needed to do to be near to God. So in many ways, use an analogy, it's an imperfect analogy, uh, Sinai is like or was like our U.S. Constitution. Think about that just for a moment. Uh, one con the Constitution is kind of a code, a, a pattern that gets repeated and, and, and hopefully maintained in some essential way, but it's also elaborated through amendments and, and other jurisprudence, uh, uh, legal wisdom, based upon new circumstances. So anybody want to go back when we didn't have the 19th Amendment, right, women's right to vote or, or right to bear arms? Sec I better not bring that up. So, so but within different contexts, you see that the Constitution was amended. And so the idea is that Sinai, like the U.S. Constitution, is repeated and revised as a pattern for knowing that and what God spoke through Moses. So think one more, a few more times of our, our young man, Saul. So Saul's reading about the Sabbath laws, and we've already seen him. He's reading in Exodus 20. He's searching to see if these things are so, and he's, he's moving through the Scriptures. Exodus 31, Exodus 35. Remember, no kindling of fires. Remember that? Teach it to your children. Eventually, he'd get to Numbers 1532, through, uh, 1532 and following, and he'd find there, in Numbers 1532 to 36, specified that the gathering of sticks is prohibited. No gathering of sticks. And if you're going to do a death penalty, at least by the example there, it needs to happen by stoning outside the camp. This is the way the, the law progresses. And he learns more about what Sabbath involves. And you, could, uh, you can multiply. <laughs> I've got all day. There's four books. We could do this. You see this repeatedly within, within the, the Torah, especially within the, the books of Moses. Moses. 
And so these examples make the point that God's law through Moses was not just a one-time list of rules to live by, but they were a collection of stories and instructions, wisdom, that required Israel to read through the books and compare the accounts to create a composite picture of God's will as revealed through time, years. And so the fact that it unfolds over years doesn't make it any less God's word from Sinai. But it took that time to reveal. It does show that the divine will is revealed through a sort of heavenly library. Who does that remind you of? A heavenly library that over time is compiled and collected and needs to be read. And so over years, you need to have patient reading and wise reflection on God's story. And so Israel is in the wilderness The law has been revealed, Moses has spoken, and yet it's still coming from that event. And God is revealing, and specifically God's Spirit is revealing. Turn with me over to Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. It's noteworthy in Nehemiah 9, verses 20 and 21, in that time of restoration, that when the Levites gather, and they have just been recalling the book of Moses and, and its meaning in their life, when they pray to God and describe the revelation of God's law in the wilderness after Sinai, they describe it as a time when God spoke through His Spirit to instruct the people. Quote, Nehemiah 9, 20, You gave your good spirit to instruct them and did not withhold your manna from their mouth and gave them water for their thirst. Forty years you sustained them in the wilderness and they lacked nothing Their clothes did not wear out, and their feet did not swell. So fifth, fifth law for reading the the, the law, rule for reading the law. Biblical obedience, obedience as described in the Bible, is wisdom. Biblical obedience is wisdom. Now, the law's Authorize, it, it, it authorizes belief and action. There's authority in the law. It authorizes things directly. There's, there's belief and actions authorized by command and example, and as what we call necessary inference. Those, th- those implications are all through the Old Testament. At the same time, living the law requires wise discernment. It's not just a fact on the page that with the flashlight of our self-battery-powered mind, we can come to. There's a sort of wisdom that's involved in discerning what the law says. It's a humble judgment to know and, and to lovingly apply what's generally approved, specifically approved, what's expedient, what's only, what's culturally bound, what's timeless. All of these things need to be discerned. Uh, There's a biblical scholar out there who writes about this named John Walton, and he's argued that we should think of the law, the laws of Moses, more like the Proverbs of Solomon. And there's something to that. You could go too far with that. But the idea there is that we we think of the laws like the Proverbs as applicable for life in a a general and ongoing way, and not something you just know when you're done. You, You need to ruminate on it and reflect on it. There's wisdom there in life for us to be able to know. And so it's less like a a modern law code where you kind of only have to worry about it when you break it. You know, it's something that you carry with it in your heart and you learn more as you go along. Uh, Moses says this, and and the Lord says this in a variety of ways um, in in Deuteronomy and Exodus. It's noteworthy to me that when Stephen talks about uh, the law, over in, you remember in Acts chapter 7, he gives the story of Israel. And he goes through and he describes the giving of the law. You remember the word he uses, Acts 7, 38. Stephen retells this, and he says, he, Moses, received the living oracles to give to us. And what that likely means is, is that the Sinai law was meant as guidance for life. It gives life, but it's for life. And so with all of the complexities of life, these oracles are living. The Word is living and active. So the law was like that. And and God tells Israel that what He's giving them at Sinai is wisdom. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 47, He tells them, this is no empty word, but this is your very life 
and the word that you shall live so that you live long in the land when you're about to go over to the Jordan. So the Mosaic laws were rules that were wisdom for God's way of living. And as I said, Moses says this, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 6, Moses tells the people that the commands he's about to give them, remember Deuteronomy 4, verse 6, chapter before the giving of the Decalogue, he says, this will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples. One thing that God is doing is showing wisdom for all to see in the people. And so this is, means that they're going to have to remember and they're going to have to teach their children. This is wisdom to be shared with the next generations. Back in Exodus, God told Moses there in Exodus 24 when he gave him the commandments that the stones of tablets, the law of the commandments were written for the people's instruction. This is, this is what Torah actually means. It's less law and more instruction, actually. And so there's this wise instruction that's given by God to the people. And because it was for life, there's situations that they would find themselves in that they couldn't read in black and white in the law, but they, knew how, they needed to know how to apply it. And God knew that, and He does some things for the people. First of all, He gives them wise rulers. It's interesting to me that in Joshua chapter 1, when Moses is telling Joshua what he's in for, there's this, this emphasis upon how Joshua, this is Joshua 1 verse 8, Joshua needs to not depart from the law, but to meditate on it day and night. Why? I mean, if it's there, why do you meditate on it? There's a, there's a wisdom there that comes from, from being careful with it, he says in chapter 1 verse 8. So it's like the Proverbs of Solomon. It's helpful for me to think about the law like that. It's to understand the law, you need to have the fear of the Lord. You need to have proper discernment, critical, probing reflection on that in order to know how to apply them lovingly and to know what examples were positive and negative and how to, to live that out in your life. They needed judgment in how to apply them. And, and what God does, you remember, is He gives Moses helpers, spirit-filled elders, and judges to help him. So, as you read in, in multiple places, in Exodus and Deuteronomy, God gives Moses people to help him. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 8 through 11, it's clear that God knows that these, these laws that he's given does not cover all of life. There's not every circumstance that, that are covered by those laws. There are general principles that need to be applied. And so, for example, in Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 8 through 11, he says, you know what, when it comes to kinds of homicides and the kinds of legal rights and kinds of assault, I'm going to give you um, judges in their day, and they're going to help apply this law, these wise, spirit-filled people. And so, these passages point to the need for ongoing interpretation, wise interpretation, and application. Let me just have a sidebar here. There's a whole history of Jewish interpretation of the law I'm not talking about this morning but which makes a lot of these kind of statements about the need for a lineage of, of judges who will help out understanding the law. So passages like Deuteronomy 17, 8 through 11 gets picked up, and the Jewish rabbis understand that the Sinai's law were unique and that times change and need to be interpreted in different ways, and so you have interpretive traditions that develop. Some elaborate on the Torah, on the law, more than others. And from, from the Mishnah to the Talmud to the Midrash to other rabbinic literature interpreting the law, you have a development of an oral Torah, a Torah which is spoken by the rabbis interpreting the written Torah. And that oral Torah, oral Torah develops to the point that it takes on an importance in some cases greater than the written Torah, and that's the world which Jesus comes. And so Jesus is speaking to some of that as he speaks to the Pharisees in, in the Gospels. The law, the Torah, had become something in many circles that it was not back in Sinai. And so it goes. New Testament. Think with me about the New Testament for the remainder of our time this morning. In the New Testament, the grace of God in Jesus Christ takes the place of the grace given through Moses at Sinai. Sinai is no longer the model, no longer the way in which God shows His purpose and the plan. Rather, it's Jesus. He is the authority. He is the standard. And we will see all of Scripture lapping back to Him, coming back to Him as the source. You remember, again, John chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. If that's one verse I would leave you with to meditate on, it's this. John 1, 16 and 17. 
from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. I believe that means grace in place of grace. That is to say that the old law was grace. But there's a new grace, a new favor that has come in its place. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Thank God, as Paul says, for the law. Grace and truth was present in the law, but now it comes through Jesus Christ. So, Jesus replaces Mount Sinai. And you see that most powerfully, I think, in the Gospel of Matthew. You know this well. Let me just kind of hit the high points for us here. The idea is that in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Jesus echoes Sinai in his self-revelation. He is the new lawgiver. He is the new law. You remember what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus makes the law more intense, <laughs> more interior, about the heart. We talk about that a lot. He says, you know, you have heard it say, but I say to you. Remember that. Matthew 5, 21 through 22, he talks about, you know, you've heard it said, whoever murders is liable to judgment, but I say, you know, whoever is angry with his brother also. So it's from, from murder to anger. It's an intensification. It's an interiorization. But beyond this, beyond the modification, Jesus replaces the law's authority. He replaces it in areas as diverse as anger and marriage and vows and charity. It's not just love. It's all of these things. Jesus replaces the law in. He reinterprets the law and he re re replaces it. You remember, I'm sure, what they say at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. They're amazed at this authority. And the reason they're amazed is, is because not only he doesn't interpret the law with authority, he is the law. He is the Word. And he presents himself as such there. So, this is the Jesus whom Saul, become Paul, is, encounters on the road to Damascus. You remember Paul when he tells us in, in Acts 22 when he's giving his defense. He says, I am a, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew. Born in Tarsus, brought up in the city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel's right over there, by the way. As he speaks, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God. And he is not saying that's a bad thing. And so, he goes on, and in Romans, he talks about his fellow Jews and positively says, you know what, they are just as strict as I was. <laughs> Over in Romans chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, he talks about his fellow Jews. He says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. How so, Paul? How did they not do what God said is right? How, did, how are they ignorant? Four, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness for everyone who believes. As you may know, the idea there, he is the end of the law. He is both the stoppage of it. We don't live under the law of Moses anymore, but he is also the end, the purpose, the telos. That's the word, double entendre. And so what Paul here is saying is, is that Right relationship to God comes not through the works of the law. And hear me now, that's not saying that right relationship with God doesn't come through our own effort. That's saying that right relationship with God doesn't come through those works of the law that Israel believed marked them off from everybody else and made them God's special people. Circumcision, feast days, etc. It's not a matter of ethnic group. It's a matter of heart. And that is very much a matter of what we do but it's not a matter of works of the Mosaic law. And so he goes on to say, what is it that, that marks one off um, as God's people? And he says, this faith that we need to make be righteous with God, it comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. And we run over that, the word of Christ, the word, the word, of, the word of Christ. What does he mean? What is that? And I just want to talk about that for the remainder of our time this morning. Christ comes to replace the law of Moses in the life of God's people. 
And so you see this in a variety of ways in Paul's ministry and his writings, and it occurs elsewhere. It's most clear, I think, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 21. This is one we know where Paul becomes all things to all people. He talks about that. But what I want to emphasize is his contrast here between the law of Moses and the law of God. It's very clear what he's doing here. And what he says, just in a nutshell, is it says, you know what, for those who aren't under, or those who are under the law of Moses, I'm going to become as one who is under the law of Moses, even though I'm not. I am no longer under the law of Moses. Makes it very clear there. That is done away in Christ. But then he goes on to say, for those whom are not under the law, I'm going to become as one who is not under the law of God. Well, he just said he's not under the law of Moses. What is he talking about? And he goes on to elaborate in the next clause there in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 21, what he means. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ. And so just like Sinai was this moment, this pattern that things went back to, to show the authority of what is being written, how we should act. Christ is that, which we keep coming back to, to show the authority of what is written and what the law is about. Is the Christian under the law of Moses? No. Is the Christian under a law of God? Yes. One in which Christ is the law, its source and its standard. And so what you, when you read the New Testament, this may be a little bit of frustrating to hear me say this, <laughs> Because what you find is that there's no one place where it says, okay, here's the law of Christ. Dun, 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 dun. That's not how it worked. It didn't work that way in the Old Testament. And it doesn't work that way in the New Testament. Remember our rules for reading the law. And just like the law of Sinai, it's not summarized in one place. Remember, the Decalogue's at least two places. And you begin to see that as you read through the New Testament that the standard of Jesus is seen in his life, in the stories of the gospel, revealed by the Spirit of God in his biography, in the histories of the apostles, in the letters, and even in an apocalypse. All through this heavenly library, the law of the Spirit is the law of Christ, and it's given throughout the entire New Testament. Now, I'm just going to say that's a controversial subject, topic, statement in some places. But that's the truth. And so, the entire New Testament becomes the standard for us, and its source is Jesus. So, Paul, you start reading, as he says, the blinds taken away, the veils removed, and you start reading the New Testament, you see this law everywhere. Just look with me, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Fulfill here means to supply or to obey the instructions, the wisdom of Jesus. The pattern here is obedience of Jesus. His faithfulness, his love is the standard. Um, I'm going to have to skip over a lot in James here. James <laughs> talks about the law very much. And in James, the emphasis is upon the ways that Christians are not under the whole law, that is the law of Moses, he talks about that in James 2, but under a law of liberty. And he uses different words to describe the law of Christ. The law of liberty in James extends to love commandments. It, talks of, it has to do with um, uh, ways that we talk. In chapter 1, verse 21, he says that this law helps us to, to know and obey the implanted word that's able to save our souls. He says it's the perfect law, the law of liberty, and it, and it extends to all sorts of actions in James. It's, it's broad, this law. It tells us how to control our speech, how to care for widows and orphans, how to abstain from worldly pursuits, chapter 1, verse 26, 27. And so, here in James, as elsewhere in 1 Peter, in Paul, throughout the New Testament, living as a Christian involves more than love, it involves obedience to a law of love. And so, you see this rule for Christian faithfulness here in James as well, this broader sense of the law that God has given uh, to us. Sixth, sixth, um, one, one, two more. Christ's law, Christ's law should promote unity, not legalism. So, the common sense this common sense by which we come to a shared understanding of God's will, 
This common sense is not some sort of instrumental, individual human reason that I have, that I kind of shine by my own power on God's Word and, and I know it's right. Rather, it's a, it's a, it's a way of being right. It's a, it's a wisdom of God that we have that comes through shared study of the Word, disposition towards God, as well as the grace of God and the, the love of God and the, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And so, in order to fulfill the law and be united, we need the wisdom of God for fellowship with God. And just as that was first revealed and experienced at Sinai in the Old Testament, it is now first revealed and experienced in God's Son. And we continue to return back to that to have His mind, to have His Spirit, so that we might fulfill the law. And so, in different places in the New Testament, the unifying law of Christ is referred to as a standard, as a pattern, a tupos. It's referred to as a standard of teaching that, that is oftentimes explicitly contrasted to the Mosaic law. We're not under the Mosaic law. For example, in Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 17, what then? Are we to sin because we are under the law, but under gra- not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin. You, you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. This standard of teaching is not about the Jewish law. It's about servitude to God through faith in Jesus Christ, and who's, he manifests himself in our obedience to this type of teaching, which later in Romans, Paul will refer to as the law of the spirit of life. All through Romans, all through James, there's Christian law. Elsewhere in Paul's letter, he uses a similar phrase to describe the apostolic teachings that express and enact faith in Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to one final passage over to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 13 through 14. Paul there says, follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me. Pattern sound words from the apostle. Okay, good. Where'd you get that from, Paul? in the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. That's the Sinai moment right there. There's the pattern, returning back to the source, and his, he, his standard gives us a pattern that's lived out in Paul's life and his teaching. And Paul will make that point very shortly. So, the words of Paul serves as a sort of normative instruction that's a type of law for the Christians. And so, in a variety of ways in Paul, you see law being described. It's law of Christ, law of the Spirit, law of faith, law of the liberty. All of these indicate this new law's place in the new covenant. You can't have a covenant without law. So, today, we're under the new law, and we're called to rightly handle this word, wisely handling it, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, understanding that the Word of God is living, and it's active, and it's discerning. We're discerning it. It's discerning us. Discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, Hebrews 4, verse 12. In other words, we need to nobly read God's Word to know the truth. We need to wisely discern it in order to apply Scripture. We need to jettison an enlightenment sort of hubris that would say that we can know what it says apart from a fear of the Lord. We need to humble ourselves before God that we may know Him. That's biblical wisdom. So, as in the Old Testament, we need to remember the commands and the examples from different contexts and imply from those proper reasoning about what God wants us to do based upon the patterns of words that He's provided. Seventh and finally, we are simply Christians, but we're not simplistic Christians. The nature of God's law, both old and new covenant, is that it is at once simple, a story of God's salvation to those who trust and obey. Amen. It's just that simple. Let's not get past that. But it's also complicated. It's complex. It requires discernment of how we should obey through inductive knowledge of the text and understanding of the principles involved. Understanding God's law requires not only conviction that there's truth there that I'm going to search for, but also compassion 
that we can all be disciples, growing in knowledge and discernment and wisdom, because we all need it. So, think about Saul one final time as I conclude. Like the young Saul, feel sympathy for you, don't you? <laughs> like that young, long, young Saul compiling passages about the Sabbath and how the table should be spread on Sabbath and what you can do on the Sabbath to know what to do. So, too, we compile and compare passages about the Lord's Day and the Lord's Table to know what to do. And the difference between us and the young Saul is Jesus. He's the difference. Through his life, we're free from the fear of spiritual death. That young Saul didn't have that. Our life is eternal life. That's our hope. And he's empowered us by our faith in him to live in obedience. So too in our day, the law of Christ, the obedience of faith, is not for our glory or power, to be sure, but is to maintain, as in Exodus, God's presence among us and with us and in us. The law is not about what I can do. It's about what God can do in me and in you. We want to be a people for his name by holy living and biblical faith. So the application this morning, I think, or an application, is to see that God's law has always been something for us to read and to be wise about, to make real in our life by God's wisdom and faithful commitment. And today, that allegiance must be to Jesus and to the revelation of His will through the apostolic writings, which is the New Testament and which is the law of Christ. Thank you all so much for your kind attention this morning.